we have two tax systems in this country. There's one to make you rich, and there's one to basically take your money and make you poor. The same thing is true with the tax game. If you don't know what you're doing, the government wins all the time. But if you know what you're doing, it's a standoff. You get a lot more benefits. And that's why it is so important to understand the basic tax rules for your business. And that's why I came out with my book, Lower Your Taxes and Achieve Financial Freedom, exactly for that reason. The government is giving you cash, giving you money yeah. to incentivize you to be in business that they're not doing for employees. Never short So my guest today on the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel is Sandy Botkin, Esquire attorney, as well as certified public accountant. And I've been a huge fan of his work over the years. Matter of fact, uh, we've had many interviews via Skype and go to meeting in the past. And we have him live and in person here, not only on this interview, but speaking to our national agency owners, owners and builders of PHP Agency. And uh, Sandy, welcome to the Seven Figure Squad YouTube channel. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm real honored. Finally in person. Finally in person. <laughs> you know, it's great. You know, my, my parents were self-employed. I'm self-employed. So I've always had a lot of respect for people willing to take a little more risk in order to make a lot more money. So I really respect everybody that is doing this. I appreciate you being here in person because I know this is your first live event you know, throughout this whole COVID pandemic, huh? First time <laughs> since COVID. It's nice to be out, let me tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Very cool. So some questions for you. First question I have for you is, you know, the first chapter of your book, why you would be brain dead not to start a home-based business because I think with everybody with the lockdowns and the shutdowns and the great resignation, the era of the great resignation, why should somebody look to start a home-based business, side business versus getting a second or third job? That's a really important point. That first chapter sets everything for the rest of the lower your taxes big time. The key here is that people ha have to realize, which many don't unfortunately, that we have two tax systems in this country. And when I say that, everybody says, oh, one for rich and one for poor, and that just isn't true. There's one to make you rich, and there's one to basically take your money and make you poor. Hmm. The one to make you, uh, make you poor is the one for employees. Because they basically, they get very little deductions. We just had this tax reform law that was passed in 2018. Right. Almost nothing came for employees. In fact, if anything, they took things away. Yep. Whereas if you're self-employed, you can write off part of your house, your spouse, the equivalent of your kid's education and weddings. You can set up a pension that makes any government plan will pull, will pull to you by comparison. I mean, the, the, the tax benefits are just enormous. Not to mention the fact that under the new law, um, if you're a self-employed or an independent contractor or anything like that, you can avoid literally uh, up to 20% of your net income and not have to pay tax on that. Can't do that as an employee. Uh, and even better, people say, well, what happens if, if I have a loss? I'm not making money. You are making money because if you have a loss, under the new stimulus law, you can carry back uh, business losses five years nice. and get a refund nice. from the federal and state government for the last five years that you paid or carry it forward forever yeah. and offset the next you know, future income. So you never lose a properly documented business deduction. And it, it, is, it astounds me. And, I, and I, to this day, I don't understand why people would want to work overtime and, and, and double time for their for their company when if they, if they you ask yourself a question if, if and, and I think anyone who's got a job if you passed away no matter how good a job you did no matter how hard you worked it would it take what would, the, would it take them more than a week to try and find somebody to replace you would they wait more than a week no they're done they're filling that position that's exactly right You know, Sandy, it's, it's interesting because you're not only talking the talk, you're walking the walk. I was asking in the hallway, when did you start uh, TRI, your own company? And because you, you stopped working for the IRS in terms of training uh, uh, IRS agents, you stopped working in the, in the late 80s, correct? That's correct. And you start, and so you, you've been self-employed and have your own corporation ever since. Uh, the question I want to ask you is, I remember <laughs> coming back from a deployment and wanting to file my tax returns so I can get my tax refund back. Why do millionaires never look to get a tax refund? Well, first of all, millionaires do look to get a tax refund, but what millionaires have that the average person doesn't have is they've got a whole staff of people working on, on their taxes and on their finances. They, that's, that's the one really critical thing that a lot of the very, very rich do. And one of their favorite things to do is to meet with their accountant, which sounds strange, right. but that is exactly one of the favorite things that they like to do. So they try very hard not to get a refund. They try by getting maximized deductions 
so that they don't have to get a refund. Remember, you get a refund, you don't get interest on that money. Correct. So they try very hard to make sure that what they pay in is equal to what they owe and they minimize the amount they owe so they can keep as much in their pocket as possible. But if they're doing a refund, believe me, they, they want it. It's a much different mindset. A, a much different mindset. The, the, the millionaires, they know they're going to pay a lot in taxes. So mm -hmm. they do everything they can to take advantage of every tax deduction that's available to them. And the sad part is that self-employed people are way overpaying their taxes. Don't take my word for it. Forbes published an article where they mentioned 93% of self-employed people are overpaying their taxes based on a study that Forbes did. I mean, John Potter, former head of the American Institute of CPAs, mm -hmm. said self-employed people are overpaying their taxes. It's common. It's a common knowledge. And it's just something that, that self-employed people really need to understand. And more importantly, employees need to understand why they should be self-employed because they can get the same benefits as a self-employed person, whether they are working, and this is an important point, whether they are working full-time or part-time. As long as they're running their business like a business and they have the right documentation, they get the same benefits of a full-time worker. So uh, instead of working person. a second job or third job, working a side business, what we call a side hustle. Absolutely. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see why people, more people aren't doing that. You know, let's, let's stay on that point because I remember in the early years of my you know, working for myself, I was enjoying these massive deductions and, and I'd make a lot of money and I'd enjoy these tax deductions, but when it came to apply for a loan to buy a house, I had to refile Mm -hmm. so I can increase my income, pay more tax, just so I can qualify for the loan. So how do self-employed people, entrepreneurs, play that game of maximizing the deductions, but at the same time to have enough showable earned income, so therefore they can qualify for the dream home? Well, first of all, if you're making enough income, it won't be a problem. So even if you maximize your deductions, you'll be making enough to buy the house or well, cash. You don't even have to get a loan, all right, which, mm -hmm. I, which many people do, okay? okay. But the second option is the bankers are not that stupid. They understand that self-employed people have lots of deductions. So you just have to point out the deductions that, that are, that are, are, that are self-employed available and especially the ones that are non-cash deductions. You know, self-employed people can get deductions that don't take any cash. A good example being depreciation. Okay. Depreciation doesn't take any cash. Sure. And they have to, you know, emphasize how important that is when a banker looks at the deductions and say, oh, some of these are non-cash deductions like depreciation, amortization, things like that. And they should filter that in and computing whether they can afford the home or not. But more importantly, you know, again, I wouldn't worry so much about, oh, gee, am I, can I afford the loan? Therefore, I'm going to refile. No, I, my, I would simply focus on not just increasing your deductions, but making as much money as you there can you so you can pay cash and not have to worry about that nonsense. So you, you mentioned car. Uh, I, I wanted to touch on that because one of the most watched videos of our last year was taking your guidance and creating a car to be a tax deductible machine if it's incorporated for business usage. So people can use that opportunity to purchase their dream their dream cars but sooner or faster, much less than what they were doing as a, just a standalone employee where they couldn't you know, have a $600, $800 car payment deduction for a Honda Accord or something like that. So what, what are some of the key areas that uh, people can use towards uh, creating their car to be a tax deductible type of opportunity. Okay. Well, first of all, let me mention that I'm, I'm giving general tax advice. Sure, this sure. isn't absolute tax. This isn't the tax opinion per se. It's, mm. it's a whole formal thing. But cars are one of the biggest write-offs around. I mean, they generate over a lifetime hundreds of thousands of dollars of write-offs if you know what you're doing, literally. Yep. And what's even better is that cars used to be limited as to what you can write off. For some reason, Congress had a thing about allowing people to write off luxury cars. So for example, if I bought a BMW, $50,000 BMW, under the old rules, it would take me uh, 18 years to write it off. Wow. That's the way it was uh, for many yeah. years, yep. all right? In 2018, we had this tax reform law. And what they did is they did some very, very important things. Number one, for if you're in business and you're writing off your car, whereas employees cannot write off the car, right. they, um, they, they've tripled the amount of the depreciation deduction that businesses can take. So that same $50,000 car, which used to take 18 years, is now 5.2 years, okay? Nice. Yep. $100,000 rolls can be, you know, 10 years. So it's 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 greatly accelerated for write-offs for almost any car that's used in business. The second thing they did was they created certain winners. There are certain winners where instead of taking a write-off over five years or six years or eight years, you can write it all off in one year. Wow. 
Winners are qualified vans, SUV, that's why you're seeing so many SUVs mm -hmm. on the road, and qualified trucks. You get those three things, and you can write them, and they're qualified, and use them in business, and you keep a good mileage log as to what's business and what's personal, you can write up 100% of the business per uh, use in the year you buy it. Amazing. And, and what's interesting is it doesn't have yeah. to be a new vehicle. It could be new, as long as it's new to you. It could be new or used. <laughs> and what's even more uh, interesting is that you get this write-off whether you pay cash or you finance the car. Yeah. So I can get a qualified SUV. Yeah. Let's, say I get, let's say I get a Cadillac Escalade, which is a good example of that, mm -hmm. by the way. In fact, every accountant I know is buying a Cadillac Escalade. Let's say you buy a, uh, let's say an Escalade, about a $60,000 Cadillac Escalade, use it 80% for business. You could write off $48,000 of es your Escalade, whether, e whether you pay cash or even if you finance the thing over five years, you still get that write off in the first year. Does it matter how you finance it, whether you get a loan or a lease? Makes no difference. Now, lease is different. Okay. Well, lease is different. If you have a lease, you don't own the car. So at that point, you don't get depreciation. You have to write off the lease part of the, uh, the lease payment. That's all you got, though. That's it. Yeah. Plus gas, plus oil, plus repairs, and so on. But you only get that nice depreciation write off, which I think you is only get that nice write -off, uh, depreciation when you buy the car, which is yeah. which raises the very good point. Yeah. Generally, yeah. it's much better off, and you get a much better write off when you own the car than when you're leasing. Gotcha. That's particularly true after the new tax reform law has greatly improved the deductions for owning a car. You know, I, I run a sales organization, so you know we, we sell insurance, retirement services, etc. Sure. And we 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 create incentives in our in our compensation to make our agents more productive. And so the way I'm looking at countries now is the tax system, because in my opinion, that's a form of compensation. So sure. I can make money in this country, and this country is now incentivizing me how to make this money in order to spend the money. Am I looking at that the right, oh, in the right you're lens? You're looking at it, absolutely. Okay. Uh, but what the government is doing here is the government is giving you cash, giving you money yeah. to incentivize you to be in business that they're not doing for employees. And that's, that's exactly what's going on. And you might wonder, you know, why is this? Why is that happening? Why is it that a self-employed person can have 20% of their net income they don't have to pay tax on, but an employee has to pay tax on everything from dollar one. Why is a self-employed person has to have pay tax on their net income <coughs> this is after yep. they take the deductions, whereas employees have to pay tax on dollar one? And the answer is that the government has realized that self-employed people, and I'm including small business corporations, I'm talking that whole gamut of small business people, yep. are the economic engine behind the economy. It's not IBM. It's not United Airlines, it's small business people like you and me. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an old saying, from little acorns come big trees. And uh, take an example like Amazon. Amazon didn't start big, it started out of Jeff Bezos' garage. garage. Yep. You know, uh, and Microsoft also started from very small. From small acorns come big trees. And that's why the government subsidizes self-employed businesses and small businesses. Yeah, the creators and the generators. That's yep. correct. So uh, today, because of TikTok and social media, people are seeing so many parts of the world through the, through the profiles of social media, of, the, of their friends, and they want to go see the world. Yeah. So, and, and also one of your chapters of your book is, how do we get the government to subsidize our fun and our lifestyle? The, well, we used to be able to write off your entertainment up to mm -hmm. through 2018, which mm -hmm. was had a number of interesting things, but they had one real negative. And the real negative was uh, you used to be able to write off all your entertainment, 50% of your fun, 50% of your movies, your plays, your bowling, <laughs> whatever yeah. you did with prospects, you could write that off. It was, people were having, people could basically golf their, their uh, taxes. Could watch a game. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, they do all kinds of things. That was eliminated by the tax oh, reform law. They kept food, but that was eliminated. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't take uh, proper trips, like foreign trips, to try and get recruits, uh -huh. to try and meet with potential distributors, yep. and then while you're adding it, you can, you know, watch, see the sites. Yep. But you, general, and, and those those trips could be deductible if you do it correctly. Okay. But the general fun itself, like they used to have, is no longer deductible. I uh, got it. Now that leads to another thing. There's a lot of foodies. There's a lot of foodies out there. People love to eat, uh, and so uh, what has changed with deduction when it comes to food? Well, there's a really interesting thing. For for years. Food uh, with prospects were 50% deductible. Again, that was because Congress, again, didn't want, they, they, don't, they don't want to give enormous benefits like, like luxury cars and be able to ride off all your food and all that other yeah. stuff. But because of what happened to re, uh, real, um, restaurants in, in, in COVID, they now allow in 2021 and 2022, uh, 
100% write-off on meals if the meals are purchased from the restaurant. That doesn't have to be eaten at the restaurant. You just have to be at least purchased wow. from the restaurant. So as long as you're eating the meal either at the restaurant or taking it home and with your prospect and, and entertaining them, you can then get a 100% deduction for meals. And that, that applies to any kind of meal. That, inc that includes wet liquor, that includes desserts, that includes steak, that includes lobster. I mean, you can, you can literally yeah. eat away your taxes. Right. It's, uh, Think it's about awesome. that. Yeah. Last couple of questions. Um, you, you mentioned something pretty awesome about kids. You know, a lot of our YouTube subscribers uh, have families. So you say pay your kids. Why? Well, first of all, if they work for you in your business, you can write off that wage and, and get a deduction for that. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, they can use that money and put that in a Roth IRA and all that appreciation can be tax free for their college, for their retirement, for all kinds of things. Okay. Uh, third thing, even if you hire them in non-business related things, you don't get a deduction, but they can put that money into Roth IRAs and, and get the same benefit. I'll put that money in a prepaid tuition plan. So all the appreciation is tax free. So why would you want to give them an allowance, which is not deductible, when you could hire them in your business, get a deduction for it, have them put money into a Roth IRA or a prepaid tuition plan, and all that appreciation is tax free. Why would you not do that? <laughs> That's crazy. Hello? <laughs> That's how people get rich. They got to, you know, this is a tax, you know, the game, this is a, like tic-tac-toe. You ever play tic-tac-toe? Of course. When you first learn tic-tac-toe, I'll bet the person who taught you won all course, the time. All the time, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what happens once you understand the game? Yeah, it was, it was like, now we get the standoff. We because got a standoff. Because I know the That's next move. That's exactly right. We have a standoff. The same thing is true with the tax game. If you don't know what you're doing, the government wins all the time. But if you know what you're doing, it's a standoff. You get a lot more benefits. And that's why it is so important to understand yep. the basic tax rules for your business. And that's why I came out with my book, Lower Your Taxes and Achieve Financial Freedom, exactly for that reason. Uh, what's probably not in the book is my last question here, because uh, you know we're in the retirement planning industry. Uh, with life insurance, and, and we mentioned it was this casual conversation. And uh, for a long time, you were, you know, not a fan of annuities. Mm -hmm. What has changed? You know, it's interesting that you said that. <laughs> when I actually wrote the book, I wasn't a great fan of annuities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what has changed is, as I've gotten older, I had uh, a complete paradigm shift. I noticed that a lot of elderly individuals became pathological savers. They, and that, that applies to me too, by the way. They, they suddenly felt, oh, we can't go anywhere because we might run out of money. That fear of running out, it could be worth $6 million. Oh, I might run out of money. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just met somebody like that, in fact. Wow. That's true of almost every elderly person I meet, unless they're worth tens of millions of dollars. But if they are receiving a pension of 60,000, 50,000 a year, 80,000 a year, they, they're receiving this income, mm -hmm. You think they have to worry about what's going on, whether they should take a cruise or, or even better, which is something a friend of mine said, you know, the stock market used to go up, the stock market used to go down. He used to get ulcers and all kinds of problems when the stock market dropped. Sure. But he was, but he, but by buying an annuity, when he started receiving $80,000 or $100,000 a year, mm -hmm. he didn't, you think he cares what kind of interest rate or whether the stock market went up or down at that point? Or where it's at. Or where yeah. it's at? Yeah. He doesn't. Yeah. So it made a huge difference to his life. It made a difference in my life. It made a difference to a lot of other people who are receiving the annuity. So I completely changed my attitude about annuities. Wow. And there are a lot of different annuities. So people need, really need to understand how annuities work. Uh, there are also tax uh, benefits to annuities, by the way. You can get the, the, your contribution all tax-free. So you can get all the money you're getting up to what you paid in tax-free yeah. until you start uh, paid in all that money. I mean, there's other benefits. So annuities are a tax deferred vehicle. So uh, yes, annuities are, are definitely part of a good financial plan. I think that everyone should have some of it, especially as they get older. Sure. And, and uh, Sandy, one of the industries most likely to make you a millionaire is financial services. Uh, yeah, there's been good to you. It's been good to you, your oh, family. Oh, there's no question. My son's a financial planner. There's no question about that. And I know yeah. I used to lecture to financial planners and yeah. oh yeah, anybody in the financial service business that I know who's been in there for a while do very, very well. And they usually outperform the lawyers, which that wow. tells you something. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. <laughs> Sandy, before I let you go, where can more people find information about you? Uh, you can get, well, let's see, you can go to sandybotkin.com, mm -hmm. which is my, my website. I also have two books that they should be aware of, as I mentioned, yes. lower your taxes big go time. Go get it. And you get that in Amazon, you get that in your bookstore or achieve financial freedom uh, big time. And that'll make their life a lot less taxing. 
hundred percent, absolutely. Well, not hundred percent in taxi, but hundred percent in terms of emotional uh, relief. With that being said, guys, I appreciate uh, Sandy's time and attention here on the Seven Fear Squad YouTube channel. He also blessed and graced our conference here to the moon, here in Daytona Beach, Florida, and uh, great reviews from everybody here. Five great. stars, five stars, five stars. I mean, if you're an Uber driver, you'd be getting five stars and tips. <laughs> so uh, make sure you follow Sandy Bakken and also he purchases content here. And uh, what are your thoughts? What are your questions? Feedback, you agree, don't agree? Put it in the comment section below. Are you gonna become an entrepreneur, at least on the side? Put it in the comment section below. That being said, on behalf of Sandy Bach, and thanks for watching the YouTube channel. If you're watching this on Facebook, make sure you click like and follow our Facebook page, Money Smart Guy. And if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you click like, hit subscribe, and also notifications to be alerted next time we upload our next episode. But I have a Sandy Bakken here from Daytona Beach. I'm your money smart guy. And until we meet again, continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today.